Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to do two things uh, this morning. We're going to look at the size of the state and how that's changed over time and where it might be heading in the future, particularly as we enter an election campaign. And then also think about the context for the election debate around spending, thinking about the, the past, the present and the future uh, and the pressures and the challenges that brings for public finances. So kicking off with uh, size, with uh, something of a spoiler in the title there, about taking spending back to the 70s. Where are we heading? Well, first of all, where are we right now? Clearly, austerity has dominated the last 10 years or so, uh, and this chart just shows you uh, just how much. It sets out spending, uh, all government spending, adjusted for inflation, all the way back to the 1950s. And the shaded bars are just showing you those periods in which spending growth, which is what we normally have, uh, paused for a while. Uh, so what it's actually showing you is the point from which we reach a peak, uh, the point at which that peak is then uh, re-met again in the future. And in most instances, the pauses are fairly short-lived. Um, the longest one prior to the last decade was in the 1980s when we obviously had uh, Thatcherism, we had privatisation, and we had a, a, a deliberate uh, shrinking of the state. But if you look at what's happened over the last decade or so, you see that actually there the pause has been even longer than in the 1980s. And if we think about what that looks like on a per capita basis, which actually makes a lot more sense uh, when you think about what does austerity uh, feel like for people, then here you see that the pause that we're, we're living through at the moment actually is, is way longer than anything we've seen before. On this basis, and this is taking the uh, spring statement figures back, uh, from back in March as the baseline here for growth going forward, uh, on this basis we have 13 years before the peak that we were at back in 2010 gets uh, re-reached. And that's almost twice as long as the pause we had in the 1980s. So really unprecedented times. And if we convert all of those numbers into uh, what spending looks like as a share of GDP, which when you think about it, if you're talking about the size of the state, what you really care about is the size of the state relative to how much uh, resource you have in the economy. Uh, this chart shows you the, the sort of the up and down of the last decade or so. So we had uh, that spike during the, uh, as we came out of the financial crisis where obviously economic output fell and therefore spending as a share of GDP uh, shot up. And then we've had that long uh, downward pull ever since, which was the, the fiscal consolidation was the period of austerity. But just at the very end of the series, you can see that it does tick up. And that's really down to the spending round uh, of September, in which the Chancellor said he turned the page on austerity. So the spending he was talking about was only spending that goes towards depart uh, departmental spending. Uh, and that's about 43% of the total. And it only goes one year into the future. So this is not sort of uh, setting out the plans for forevermore. But nevertheless, it did mark a, a change of direction that the line starts to tick up again. And in actual fact, uh, the plan at the moment is that by 2020-21, uh, spending will be at 40.6% of GDP, which is roughly where it was, in fact, maybe even a little bit higher uh, going into the financial crisis, and certainly a lot higher than the average we had over the course of the 80s and 90s, uh, post that Thatcherism uh, moment, but still lower than it was in the 1970s, uh, pre-Thatcher, uh, when it was at 42% on average. But nevertheless, uh, I think you know, we have changed direction. So what comes next? Um, well, much like the Chancellor's stance, I think it's about to get bigger, uh, whoever wins the election. So from the Conservative uh, perspective, and particularly for the Chancellor, uh, at the spending round, alongside setting out the figures for 2021, he talked about actually moving into a new phase, a new decade of renewal, he called it. And he um, paid particular attention to capital spending, talked about rebuilding our national uh, infrastructure. And that was a theme that he'd also talked about in the uh, Conservative Leadership Contest, where he'd actually pledged a £100 billion national infrastructure fund. So it remains to be seen, uh, once we get the manifesto, is exactly what the Conservative plan is. But I think it's fairly clear that they, the intention is to increase the size of the state, to spend more, especially on capital. And for Labour, I think we only need to look back two years to the 2017 election and look at the manifesto then, which had lots of spending pledges across a whole range of areas. So tuition fees, childcare, schools, healthcare, social security, social care. And again, uh, on the capital side, the idea of a national transformation fund. £250 billion pounds, uh, spread over 10 years. And the Labour Party costed all of that up, and their, their own figures said that they were going to be spending an extra £49 billion pounds a year on current uh, uh, expenditure, 
And if you take the 250 billion capital over 10 years, well, that's 25 billion a year. So that's big numbers. Now, since 2017, of course, things will have changed. Some priorities will have shifted. We've heard uh, other spending pledges from Labour since then. Some of these spending pledges that were already in place may, may have been uh, usurped by other things that have come along. But I think we can expect something of a similar scale uh, in the next manifesto. So ahead of the manifestos, let's do a bit of speculating about what the different parties uh, might be wanting to deliver. And this is obviously uh, our best guess, if you like, so this is not uh, scientific by any, by any means. But what we're doing here is we're saying for the Conservative Party, first of all, let's assume, having just delivered the spending round, that they want to maintain the momentum on current spending. And so having brought up some of that departmental spending, they don't want to drop it down again. So let's maintain the share of GDP going on current expenditure. On Social Security, uh, I don't think we're looking at any particular changes from where we were back at the Spring Statement in March. We had yesterday um, news around the fact that the, uh, the four-year benefit freeze was going to be ended from April. Well, we already knew that. Uh, that is the government default. That was in the March figures. Uh, so I don't think we're necessarily expecting anything different from that from the Conservative Party. So the big change really is on the capital side, where if we take uh, the Chancellor at his word, then we might expect some big boost to capital spending over the next few years. Now, you might get some different variation on all of that, but nevertheless, I think this is probably the right direction of travel. And what it is, it takes us to 41.3% of GDP uh, spending, which I think is you know, it's not quite at the 1970s level, but it's certainly heading up in that direction. And it doesn't take much more in terms of you know, a bit of extra money for the NHS or for schools for that figure to very rapidly uh, get towards the 1970s average. So then what about Labour? Well, if we just plug in the 2017 manifesto figures, that uh, uh, 49 billion on the current side and 25 billion on the capital side, then we're in a world in which spending as a share of GDP is at 43.3%, uh, well above the 1970s average and actually the ninth highest uh, of any year in the period here. So whichever party uh, forms the majority part of the next government, and we're assuming it's one of the two, uh, it looks like spending is on its way up, uh, heading back towards the 70s. But what's the backdrop for that, and why does that matter for the election campaign? So I think there's really there's three, there's a triple public finance challenge, if you like, looking to the past, the present, and the future. So thinking about the past, there is the austerity legacy. The fact that lots of public services have had their funding cut, and so there are some se severe pressures there. But also that the nature of the state has changed, you know, what the state does has changed over the last decade. Uh, and that's the starting point for any new spending plans. In terms of the present, there's the fiscal situation that we need to contend with, where the current fiscal rules you know, are broken. It's, it's very hard to make a case uh, that they're not. Um, and so the parties in presenting the new spending plans also need to think about what fiscal framework they want to situate them within uh, and what fiscal rules they want to put in place and fundamentally how they're going to pay for it. And then on the future, there is the demographic headwind about, uh, associated with ageing, which we've known about for some time, but that is now becoming more and more manifest as the years go by uh, and brings with it challenges of its own. So today we're not going to do the second one of those. Uh, we had a whole event on that last week, but it is there in the report, so do go away and read that. So instead we're going to focus on, on the past, the austerity legacy, and on the future, the demographic headwind. So we're heading back to the 70s on spending, uh, but things ain't what they used to be. Um, and the change really has been, has been brought about, obviously austerity has, has dominated everything and means that there's a constrained uh, fiscal envelope out there for governments to work with, but then there have been deliberate and active policy choices within that envelope. Uh, which have meant that the focus of the state has changed quite a bit. And as we say there, particularly a growing focus on the old and the sick. So if you think about the departmental spending, first of all, um, overall, departmental spending uh, per person has fallen. This chart shows you how that plays out across the different departments. So it shows the real terms cumulative change since 2009-10 uh, across different departments adjusted for population growth. And what you get is that at the top there you've had uh, growth overall in some departments, so particularly health, international development, which reflects the fact that we've protected NHS spending and we've protected foreign aid spending. But at the bottom, you've got local government budget cut by 77%, uh, budget more than 50% uh, down in housing communities, in transport, in work and pensions, more than a third down in many other departments. So some really big cuts to, to many departments, uh, brought about by the fact that they have not had that same protection. And so within a squeezed envelope, uh, it is those um, departments which have borne the brunt. 
And you can see the lighter bars there just showing you where we were in 2019-20, so ahead of the spending round. And you can see that that spending round has turned the page on austerity, but actually what that means is, yes, a bit more money for all the departments, but, but really a long way to go for many of them. And that obviously changes the balance of what uh, each pound that gets spent on departments uh, looks like. So back in 2009-10, 31p of every pound went to the Department of Health and Social Care. By next year, 2020-21, that's going to be 40p. So an increasingly uh, dominant factor in overall spending on departments. Education and defence have pretty much held their own. They faced cuts, but those cuts are pretty much in line with the average. DFID has grown, obviously, because of that protection for uh, foreign aid, but remains very small. So although it's been a, a, a big winner, if you like, uh, it's not really a, a big factor in overall spending. And so what happens is it's all the rest. It's, it's the others uh, that get residualised, that, that face the brunt of the squeeze. So a big change in what uh, the state does in terms of departments. But a big change, too, also on social security, where... Uh, this is showing you the proportion of each pound spent on Social Security, where it goes. And you can see 2007 8 37% went on the state pension. Uh, by next year, that looks like being 44%. So again, this has become a more dominant part of the overall picture. Disability and incapacity benefits, actually, that's the biggest proportional increase from 14% to 19%. Child benefit has gone the other way, down from 7% to 5%. And again, it's all the others uh, at the end there which have face the biggest part of the squeeze. Now you might say that's down to uh, you know, the ageing population, of course, are spending more on the state pension as we get older. But actually, what's been going on over the last 10 years is less about demography and more about policy. Uh, and in particular, the, the policy to increase the state pension aid, first for women and then, and then for all, uh, has actually pushed back against a rising pensioner bill. But instead, what we've seen is the, the triple lock, meaning that uh, the average per pensioner has been going up. And at the same time, we've had uh, big cuts for working age welfare, which has meant that the average per non-pensioner has been coming down. And you see that in this chart here, which just sets out that spending on a per-person basis. And you can see spending of pensioners and non-pensioners rising broadly in line in terms of the overall generosity uh, across most of the period, but then clearly diverging over the last 10 years. And that has driven, that deliberate policy choice has driven the changing balance we've seen on the social security side. And if you bring all of that together, what does that look like? It means that for every pound of government spending back in 1997-98, uh, about 28% went either to old age social security or to health. By 2007-08, that was up to 33%, so we were already moving in that direction. But as of 2018-19, it was 37%. So an increasing dominance for those two factors, which means other things, of course, uh, end up getting squeezed. You can see defence there declining, public order spending has declined over this period as a share of the total. So that's, the le that's, that's sort of where we are and that's the legacy that uh, the next government needs to think about when it's setting out new spending plans. What does it want to prioritise? Does it want to continue in the same direction? Does it want to plug some of the gaps that maybe have opened up over the last 10 years as funding has been cut? But they're crashing into another factor which is going forward there's going to be a growing focus on the old and the sick, even without a policy uh, attention, because of the demographics. So that demographic headwind that we've talked about for some time, which hasn't yet blown particularly hardly, hard, now is. So these are OBR figures rather than mine, uh, and these roll us forward into the middle of the century. Uh, and what they're doing is they're taking a policy neutral position. So they're saying, what if government didn't really change anything uh, from today's uh, policy setup. What happens if we just allow the population to evolve in the way that we expect it to evolve, uh, and also a bit of uh, health costs rising above uh, the speed of inflation, which is what they tend to do. And what you get is that a massive increase in the proportion of GDP that has to be allocated towards health and towards, towards old age uh, social security. And if we pretty much maintain everything else at, at more or less the same level of GDP, then that means overall we end up spending a lot more on, uh, 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 as a percentage of GDP uh, from the state. So these figures aren't directly uh, comparable to, to what I was showing before, but if we applied our figures to, to this growth, then we'd be looking at a state which comprises about 48% of GDP 
which is well above anything we've seen uh, over the course of the series that I set out before, well above that average in the 1970s and well above uh, the figures that we've set out under both the Labour and Conservative scenarios earlier. So a huge change. And of course it's a huge change in which we are driving ever more towards old age and towards health. So rising from about a third today to more like a half uh, once we're halfway through this century. And that means, of course, things like education start to form a much smaller part of the total. So a big demographic challenge and one that the parties, I think, need to start rising to now, really. So this is going to be uh, an issue that f lots of future governments are going to have to contend with. But if you're a party right now about to write up a manifesto um, promising lots of spending rises, then you also need to be thinking about, well, how do those spending rises fit within the challenge that's to come? And start talking, not necessarily in the election campaign, because this is not popular stuff, but start talking about how we approach the coming demographic headwind. And it's really tough questions. It's questions like, do you change the health and the pensions offer? So the, the figures I've just set out are based on the idea that the health and the pensions uh, offer that people get in the future is pretty much the same as it is today. Are we saying that actually we can't possibly afford to go down that route? We might have to start rationing in some way or changing uh, the nature of what people get from the health service or what they get from their state pension. Do we instead cut back on other services, effectively doubling down on austerity? Uh, the difficulty there, of course, being that we already have huge cuts in place for lots of departments. How much more can they withstand over coming decades? Is it a case of shifting more into the private sector? Uh, perhaps user charging or perhaps just wholesale moving things elsewhere or asking people to, to top up. Uh, again, hugely controversial stuff and not stuff that's necessarily going to uh, play out well in the election campaign. But I think even if you had some combination of all of those first three, uh, it's very hard to see how you get away without doing some, some of the latter one here, which is raising taxes. And it'll be interesting to see how much of that comes out in the, in the debate over the coming weeks, where when Labour set out their 2017 uh, manifesto, they included lots of tax rises designed to, to fund at least the current side of it, whereas at the moment from the Conservative side, all we've heard about really is tax cuts. Now tax cuts are more popular than tax rises, but uh, I think the latter is, uh, as I say, inevitable going forward, and it's important that we have an honest debate on that. So a few conclusions then from all of that. Um, we'd expect, in the end, Brexit to dominate this election. It hasn't yet, but uh, there's a long way to go. But whether or not it does, I think there is a big debate about the size and shape of the state to be had. Um, I think it's likely that we're heading back towards the 70s in terms of spending as a share of GDP. But in setting out spending increases, I think the parties need to be honest and need to think about the, the three pieces of context here. Austerity and those active policy choices which have meant that pensions and health have increasingly dominated state spending and some public services are now uh, very stretched. The fiscal framework, which is broken, uh, we do need new rules and we do need to think about how we're going to fund any of these spending promises going forward. And then those coming demographic pressures, which just add urgency to those fiscal questions, but also just that general question of what's the state for? We've got tough choices to come, so we need to make some decisions now about what we want the state to be doing. If we can't do everything, what do we want it to do? So a big debate to be had, and as anyone who lived through the 1970s will remember, uh, debates in the 1970s have a habit of getting pretty tasty pretty quickly. Thank you. What is it with the pitch black? I'd like some lights. I'm finding it hard to see. David, the lights are behind your head. I think there may be lights behind you guys, leaning against the wall. I don't know. Stay away from the wall. The wall's a dangerous place. There, yeah, thanks. I can see you all now. That's very reassuring. Uh, Matt, I was going to say thank you, and then you ruined it with that ridiculous 70s pastiche at the end there. But the, uh, it's fine. I'll get over it. The, um, look, the, before he did that, the basic point is, which is that the size of the state has yo-yoed over time. Those are big, big changes, but that the shape does as well. And obviously, it was the coalition government that did a lot of that resizing and reshaping over the first five years of this decade. So, Polly, what's going on? Uh, well, I certainly can't talk to the 1970s because I was born in 1980. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God! It's okay, Ben. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get defensive. We're going to blame you for everything pre-1980 later. Oh, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So, I mean, obviously we're in an election period and election periods, I think, are a really bad time to end up with sensible tax and spending policies. Um, so the triple lock is something Matt mentioned. And uh, so for a long time, the Liberal Democrats, uh, I started working with the Liberal Dems in, in 2004, uh, had been campaigning for uh, the restoration of the earnings link, which Thatcher had got rid of. Um, and then, uh, you know, we had a sort of financial crisis and earnings started not growing very much, as you guys have analysed in, in a lot of depth. And so this pledge became a bit rubbish. And so it was literally in order to fill this empty box on Liberal Democrat leaflets that we in the Liberal Democrat Policy Unit, uh, along with Steve Webb, kind of came up with, well, well what else can we say? Because we don't want to, we, we've got to have something to tell the pensioners about why we're great. And so we came up with this other policy. And of course, then it was in our manifesto. And then because it was in the manifesto, it was in the coalition agreement. And, you know, that's, I don't know, at 90 billion pounds spent by a couple of, you know, 29 year olds making up policy. Um, because, you know, that's that's what elections do. And, you know, it's not just the Liberal Democrats who, who make up ways to spend tens or hundreds of billions of pounds on the back of envelopes. Uh, in fact, that's quite hefty policy development. But mainly the Liberal Democrats. So, so, <laughs> That's not fair. Joke. <laughs> totally unfair. Joke. Joke. Um, we had Diane Abbott talking about police officers that cost ten pounds. We've got you know Boris Johnson and three hundred and fifty. You know, like it's actually just this kind of in the nature of election campaigns, and increasingly in the nature of election campaigns. That's not a, a that's not a statement I can kind of back up with evidence, but but it feels like there is this increasing disconnect between the details of policy and what people say. In that the art of writing a manifesto ought to be for, and, and I guess was less because the Liberal Democrats just didn't have that discipline of expecting to be in government, uh, ought to be trying to manage what looks good on leaflets combined with what is possible. And because, weirdly enough, people have somehow stopped being punished for making stuff up or not delivering stuff, the need to consider, actually, hang on, we might need a fiscal rule that the markets might take seriously or that we can actually use to govern decision making when it's so much easier to make it up as you go along which is of course something that our prime minister has done his entire life and i, I didn't make it up as i went along i wrote some notes before <laughs> by stealing matt's notebook because i forgot to bring a notebook so i feel like i'm very zeitgeisty uh, but not quite as good as the prime minister just randomly making it up but but elections mean that there is huge um pressure to spend more, especially in this election where we know that if the election moves away from Brexit, as it sort of seems to be doing, uh, to public services, we have this legacy of, of austerity uh, and, uh, and demands for increasing public services are very high. And so people will ask for more money. The government will, both parties are pledging vast quantities of money. We also know that Boris Johnson, in order to keep part of his party on board, will also want to pledge tax cuts. The first pledge he made in his leadership campaign was to cut taxes for, uh, for the higher earners. Um, and so even though he hasn't repeated that, you know that it's going to be part of his, uh, his worldview, something that kind of comes along. Uh, you know, there's still plans for cuts to corporation tax, a whole range of, of tax cuts. Um, it's interesting that they talk a lot about infrastructure, rightly. You know, I think one of the biggest fiscal mistakes made by the coalition was to, <laughs> to cut uh, capital expenditure. Uh, I think you know, m most people would agree that that was high on the list of mistakes, though let's not get into the list of mistakes because it's a boring conversation. Um, but, but Matt's then talking about this kind of growing focus on the old and the sick. And spending money on old people and sick people is, is I mean, it's good. I, I don't oppose that. It is morally good. You know, you will get lots of people saying that how you judge a society is how it treats the poorest and the weakest. And, and that's reasonable, right? But these are social choices. They're not investment choices. And actually, if the state is more and more being occupied with economically inactive people having nice lives, which is a good thing, uh, it has less and less resources available to actually grow the economy, and it's it, so it's a it's a funny sort of shift that we're happening, ha that, that we're facing. Uh, the more they, they they don't really talk about they don't talk about welfare, they don't talk about they, nobody celebrates the fact that the incapacity benefit uh, and its replacements have expanded as a proportion of the welfare state. N nobody's nobody's excited about that. In fact, it's basically a kind of catastrophic policy failure because for twenty five years. 
politicians have been talking about reforming disability benefits in order to stop leaving people on the scrap heap and enable them to get into work and become economically inactive. So there's a huge shift between the narrative about investment infrastructure and the reality of money going more and more and more on, on the economically inactive. Um, and I think there is a problem, unless we all just sign up to modern monetary theory, um, which I don't think is going to go down well in this room, uh, nor a, a any sensible room. Um, uh, is that actually if you carry on increasing spending and you cut taxes and you're not even spending money on the stuff that grows the economy, you will end up with a bigger and bigger hole. And at some point, the make it up as you go along strategy of not caring about fiscal rules does become a real problem because we have this kind of demographic, uh, huge demographic shift. It's incredibly difficult to um, take money off old people. Uh, very easy to give money to old people. It's extraordinary. With this thing about uh, TV licenses for pensioners. Uh, I can see some people who might be eligible in the room for it, so I'm going to. Dangerous thing is, of course, pensioners should not get free TV licenses just randomly by being 75. If people have need because they are lonely, because they're desperately poor, of a free TV license, great. But the idea that it's a sort of a, a reward for just getting to be old to me is completely ludicrous. People say, oh, I've paid in all my life, and now I deserve a free TV license. But like, I've bought chocolate for the last 40 years. At what point do I don't get free chocolate? And it, well, maybe I do. Maybe that's a policy that I, wish I should vote for. But so we have this very bizarre way of kind of treating old people, which is that they can't be cut. And so as the group of old people gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that is a, a spending problem. We've then got immigration, another huge demographic change. We don't really, uh, we don't really have any way of reducing immigration. You know, Theresa May as Home Secretary and Prime Minister tried desperately hard to reduce immigration. Fine, we will uh, end freedom of movement when we leave the European Union. But nevertheless, the kind of the the the, the shift in the way people live their lives uh, around the world, more and more people living outside their country of origin, and our need demographically for more and more people means that you will have a growing population and a growing, increasingly diverse population. And uh, for all that we might wish, wish that it wasn't so, that makes it harder to build solidarity narratives about I should pay money in order to help those people when some of those people are newcomers or foreigners or other sort of ghastly things. Um, I don't really think they're ghastly, just to be clear. Plus, then you've also got technology, the shifting, uh, the shifting the tax base. You know, we know how hard it is to tax um, petrol, but we are moving from petrol to electric cars, which is a good thing, but means that we need to find a way to tax electricity in order to replace that. You've then got the shifting kind of tax base of these global digital giants. Uh, so getting our hands on taxes is becoming increasingly difficult whilst the spending pressures rise. I'm just sort of repeating what Matt has said. But, um, and I, I guess what I really worry about is that if the way we make these decisions is that every five years or perhaps every two years, God forbid, hmm. we have an election where people promise impossible things that pull us further and further away from reality, we are in serious trouble because at some point... At some point, deficits do matter. Uh, and at some point, uh, reality will start to constrain decision making. And I, I think we need to find a new way to engage the public around tax and spending decisions so that people aren't asked to choose mutually incompatible things like lots more money whilst uh, for all the public services you care about with way less tax. Um, and I think that has to involve people in a deliberative process to actually engage with the challenge of this growing tax gap. Uh, and I worry that our politics isn't really fit for purpose. So that's very cheerful. Great. Thank you for that, Polly. <laughs> Elections are expensive, we learned. Good oh. Do I click a button? Does click. something happen? Great. There you are. Um, so I'll just look at where the British public is on this. And the, and the bottom line is that the British public is not anywhere near as ideological as some politicians. So they, um, they, they, you know, they seem to want at the moment a society which tends to be a bit more about collectiveness rather than a sort of one where everybody stands on their own hind feet. And what we've seen since the crash is a shift in that direction. So in 2006, people were sort of split between whether you wanted a society that was a bit more sort of Scandinavian or a society that was a bit more American. What's happened since the crash is that we seem to have shifted back towards wanting a bit more of a collective 
view. We've just got global data on that. So we're, we're far below Denmark and Holland, where it's sort of 70% plus, and we're nowhere near like America, where, where actually the numbers are pretty much the other way around. Uh, so the Americans think everybody should, but there aren't many countries in the world where people want uh, individuals to look after themselves. But it does seem to be this shift. We've gone from, you know, globalization, liberalization of trade, get citizens to get her minimum and then help them stand on their own two feet to a world where now they're to be protected against globalization, against immigrants, against people buying up our companies, etc., uh, etc. Et um, and there's, there's the global data. So you can see America down at the bottom, only 35% of them want it. The Chileans, who are rioting at the moment, uh, are at the top. They're very keen on um, a so, a, some sort of collectivism. Uh, but it, we're sort of mid-table, so we're, as usual, and on most of these things, we're pretty sort of mid-table, next to Russia. Um, yeah, uh, although the Russians don't get anywhere near as much um, as people here do. Um, but we're also, but when you start to break this down and look at it by things like Brexit, again, you see that, you know, Labour Remainers, very keen on a, a sort of a social and collective provision of welfare. There's Labour Leave, a bit less keen. There's Conservative Remain, getting, getting bid into, bid into uh, stand on your own two feet. And uh, ha I haven't shown the Brexit party on here, but Conservative Leavers anyway, definitely stand on your own two feet. So, you know, we are divided about that, as, and these same divisions apply on a whole load of other cultural things, but we're not going to talk about that today because we're talking about the state. Um, generally, we've seen a decline, we saw a decline towards 2010 in the proportion of people who said that government services should be extended, even if it means taxes going up. Since 2009, that number has gradually increased again. Um, generally, people always say in Britain that, you know, um, we should spend more on public services and other people's taxes should go up. Um, that's the challenge, of course. And one of the challenges for Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald is whether his tax rises will be for the many uh, as well as the few. Um, and and uh, I'd be interested to know what uh, the panel thinks on that. But generally, the public likes spending more money, and particularly hypothecated taxes on things like the NHS at the moment. We can get two thirds of us to say that we will personally, at least tell me, they will personally pay more money um, for the NHS. So that's the challenge. And I think that the key thing in this is not so much. Um, left, right. The public wants to see a bit more public spending. We've heard that both parties are going to spend a lot more, but ultimately it will come down to perceptions of competence. As many people believe that Tony Blair would put up taxes in 1997, as believed Neil Kinnock would in 1992. Blair won by a landslide, Kinnock didn't. Um, why? Well, partly a bit more austerity in real terms by 97, but also actually people believing that Blair would spend the money wisely, Kinnock they were less confident and that is the challenge facing Labour. They are not ahead um, on things like the NHS that you might expect them to be. So people are pretty downbeat about what's going to happen in the NHS. Um, they've become a little bit more cheerful recently as more money has been announced but generally they've been pretty negative even when money was pouring in around, this is around 2007 before the, you know, before the um, government changed, people were saying it was going to get worse rather than better. So we tend to be pessimistic about the future um, but we're certainly not buying it that it's all going to be wonderful. So you might I say this is good because the public is going to be realistic. We know in other polling that only about 14% believe that the money that's been announced is actually going to fix the NHS. So perhaps they're a bit more realistic than we might think. They also think that crime is uh, not going to get any better. If I can have that one. Yeah, is policing going to get better? Mm, it's probably going to get worse rather than better. So we're not particularly cheerful. The reason, of course, why Boris Johnson is visiting hospitals is because he has to neutralise Labour on the NHS. And it's been fascinating to look at his election promises. These are the areas that people want prioritised. The NHS, education and the police. Um, benefit payments and defence down at the bottom, because obviously on the undeserving poor, etc. Um, a few more people interested in housing. But really, it's all about those things, of course, that, you know, perhaps not stupidly, uh, Mr Johnson has said that he's going to put money into. So the public is... Uh, you know, he's focusing on the things that the public so they, they prioritise and we will see how that plays out in terms of the results in a few weeks' time. What I would say is that the one thing that unites people in Britain is that they all want everything to be the same everywhere. So whether you vote, um, you know, orange, red or blue, should the NHS be the same everywhere in Britain? Yes. Should recycling be the same everywhere in Britain? Yes. We just want a government that will fix things for us. And we're not particularly ideological about exactly how big it is. It will ultimately come down to who is believed to be more competent in delivering this. Although all politicians at the moment have some of the worst ratings we've ever measured. We have the most unpopular leader of the opposition ever. And we have the most unpopular new prime minister ever. The end. Thank you. <laughs>
just use competing with Polly to end on the most depressing right, well. fact. Although Matt did have his graphic of hell, so yeah, maybe everyone's yeah. as bad as each other. Right. The, um, let's just pick up on a few of those points before we go to um, questions. So on this, this is one strange thing, which is you get views on where are the where have the libertarian Tories gone? Okay, so like if, a while back you had like. What a, does Liz Truss say about all so, this? Well, she doesn't. That ah. question has not been asked yet. But there were so so for those not spending their time in the weeds. Clearly, <laughs> a Conservative Party brought up in lots of ways in the 1980s, where their USP was controlling this state that had become too powerful. Freedom was per, like the delivery of freedom was part of the core purpose. Read the 1979 yep. manifesto. That's what it's all about. And you did have you have Conservative politicians who grew up in that all the way through the 2000s. That's still their motto. And as you say, Liz Truss is the queen of freedom Twitter. The, um, everything is about Uber, Deliveroo, the new freedoms you can get, getting planning regulations out of the way, a smaller state. That side of the Tory party has just disappeared under a Boris Johnson government. I don't know what they would say because I've not heard them being asked it. Any journalists here? You can ask them. But, the, um, but where's it gone? Well, I, th I think they've just shown that they're very, very pragmatic in all sorts of ways, including the ERG group, who are now cheerfully seeing Northern Ireland set up border controls with the rest of the UK. So I, uh, it, it just appears that political, political pragmatism is the order of the day. Is there any public appetite for proper libertarianism? Not much. No, people generally prefer, we, we tend to, you know, we tend to want well-funded public services. Admittedly, we don't necessarily want to pay for them, but we believe in uh, we believe in strong public services, particularly the NHS. On the on the Liberal Democrats, did the have the like Social Democrats is the takeover of the Liberal Party so complete that there's no real Liberals left? Uh, I think it's complicated. I mean, the party shrank so much in terms of its parliamentarians uh, that it. It's quite hard to have factions among nine people. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> so the Labour Party can manage. The Labour Party would definitely manage yeah. um, but Obviously, it's expanded. There's an, and, but there's a lot of... Uh, it's all about Brexit, and obviously having a single enemy helps to unify a whole range of different factions. I think the sort of libertarian conservatives are, are their youth movement, actually. It's really interesting to see... The you know, sort of uh, Darren Grimes, and then then there's this uh, what's it called? Some turning point. Mm. This sort of like the is it? Yeah, it's called turning point. Phew. Um, it's just like the momentum of the of the young Tory right. movement, and they do all these uh, like really funny little skits, sort of IEA type. Uh, uh, when taxpayers say, when Alliance funny, type things. They're dreadful. They're funny, dreadful. Okay, they're they're, it's like giving comedy <laughs> lectures about Marxism and how bad it is, as if they're Owen Jones. It's like, it's okay. Funny. Anyway, but, and but they are libertarians. But you know, because we know there's most young people do not vote uh, conservative, but those who do, at least those who are passionate about it, seem to be this group of of libertarians who who idolise Liz Truss. Okay, which is a life choice. That is. That's the thing to do. <laughs> Everyone has to do what they do. The, um, okay, what about, um, so the flip side of this is, so one reading of what we've been saying here, which is a kind of, which is both for political reasons, plus for demographic and other pressure reasons, everyone's now a social democrat at a time when no party wants to call themselves a social democratic party. So we're going to get a bigger state, we may or, not pay, we may or may not pay for it, but we're going to do it. But the, so the, the interesting bit then in some ways in this election, so the last election, the last few elections have been, generally more spending for Labour, less spending for the Conservatives. Here we're now in a race for who the amount of the right amount of extra spending. But uh, in some ways the bigger difference is that now this time, unlike in 2017, Labour is proposing tax rises, but the Conservatives, rather than proposing basically not a lot on tax, are proposing big tax cuts probably. Well wait and see the manifesto, yeah. but probably. Is that a what's the demand for and that's weird because they spent ten years caring about the deficit, but now they're promising more spending and tax cuts. Where's the you know, where's the, is there any, any problem on proposing tax cuts? I don't know if there's a, I wouldn't say there was a problem on proposing tax cuts. Um, you know, and their target groups will feel under pressure. They'll feel, they, you know, they're in, as you have d demonstrated time and time again, they're going to feel, lots of people would still be grateful for a, for a tax cut, particularly if he also at the same time says he's going to put money into the health service. Uh, so let's see, everybody, and everybody tends to think that people earning a bit, you know, 10 grand more than them, 20 grand more than them should pay more tax. They're, they're always quite happy with that. But in the, if you, we look back to the 2000s, one of the things that Conservatives learned from a number of election defeats was promising tax cuts can be heard as your public spending will be... 
Cool. Yeah. Even if you don't say it. But I think this time they've gone they've gone loud and long on the spending before they've got and we don't well we don't yet know that they are going to do the tax cuts and therefore borrow vast amounts of money but you could you could easily see it coming but they haven't done it yet so who knows okay now matt what about on just on this old estate thing Mm. okay which is so one reading of what we've shown here i don't know if you'll have control of your charts but so Spending shoots up in the crisis as a share of GDP. It's really doing that because the economy is shrinking as a share of GDP. It's a really bad recession. Okay, so it's measured as a share of GDP. Even if you hold your spending pretty constant, you get a big spike. And one way of thinking about the last decade is it's getting back from that spike, forty-six point six from memory, yep. percent of GDP back down to around. We're now around the levels we were at in the mid two thousands. The, um, but one, the, like the sales pitch for what's happened, if you were here, the, um, I'm kind of giving a sales pitch for the first five years of this decade, this is me being nice, uh, is that, look, the state is going to become being about old people and the health service anyway, and so basically we just did that. And in the end we were going to have, we had to do it a bit faster because this big recession, but broadly we just did what the times demanded. Is that our reading of history? Any views? I, I think that, uh, not to be unkind, I think that... Uh, sounds a bit too strategic I think there, there was you know, what matters to voters what matters to the um, the public image you present as a government is what you do with the most vulnerable and the most visible in society and so the NHS is obviously always going to be a priority for whoever's in power and uh, supporting older people is obviously going to be a priority for those reasons and all that is happening is in a world in which there just isn't as much money to go around of course those are the areas that end up dominating. And I think that is more down to, you know, it's just residualization than uh, a clear strategy. And the problem now, of course, is that demographic uh, movement that is coming, that wasn't apl- applying in the last 10 years. You know, very, very slightly. We've not yet seen the baby boomers move into retirement in any significant number. So the idea that we're already in a position where those are the spending priorities that are dominating all else before we've even had the demography. That, that just makes it much more difficult now to, to react to that if one of your reactions is to say, well, actually, we're going to have to um, deprioritise some other stuff. You've already de- deprioritised it, so where are you going to go? Polly, is that fair? You- yeah, I think it is fair. I think there is a massive absence of strategic thinking. Uh, and, uh, but the coalition government was probably marginally more strategic than the current crop. Uh, I th- seems to me that people are just not addressing the scale of the problem at the kind of the top of our political leadership. Um, there's, Tony Travers said it, uh, as you know, everyone knows there isn't going to be a tax gap of 100 billion, so we're not doing anything about it. And you, well, we've got to do something about it. You, you actually need to make big decisions. And they are big and difficult decisions, which the public might struggle with because it's perfectly reasonable to want more public services and for somebody else to pay for them. I mean, of course people want that. Like, why should we expect everybody to be, you know, thoughtful and honourable and, and worry about the entire architecture of the state? It's, it, you can't expect people to think that when the only power they have is to vote once every four minutes <laughs> <laughs> in an election. And the problem, you know, actually compressing the election schedules into, you know, uh, 2015, 2017, 2019 means that people are even less strategic because they're just thinking about, OK, now's the moment. And, you know, I guess the when the Labour government came to power in 1997, it, because it won such a big majority, it was thinking about being in power for 10, 15, 20 years. And it did things like set up a strategy unit and and, and worry about uh, what the fiscal rules should be or what a long-term approach to growth should be. And I, I, I honestly, uh, Sajid David's barely the Chancellor. I mean, Boris Johnson's team make all the decisions about whether he's even having a fiscal event. Right. Sorry, I'm um, not There might be some trivia officials here. Right, okay, let's... So I'm, I'm we'll muddle through. Well, I'm, the one yeah. big contradiction yeah. contradict me from what we're saying, which is mm-hmm. you're saying what the public cares about. Yes, everyone's going to spend more, but they care about competence a lot. Yes. But Polly's reminding us that you can get away with making stuff up as you go along. So how do those two things get reconciled? Well, it's their judgment of competence. And ultimately, I mean... It doesn't tell the truth. If you come to the NHS, there is a tipping point. So 
people only really recognise Labour's doubling of investment in the NHS and spend on the NHS towards the end of their time in office, when they start, when suddenly they got waiting times down to eight weeks. It doesn't. There isn't a linear relationship between public perceptions and concern and what's actually happening at the moment. Things are getting worse, but it's a bit like the frog in the saucepan. It hasn't got hot enough, which is why the Conservatives in some polls are actually leading Labour on the NHS, which is, which is again a major challenge for Labour. I would suggest. We'll see what happens during the campaign. But your numbers did show, like, what is it, 60, 70% thinking the NHS is getting worse? Yeah, yeah, oh, sure, but they always do. I mean, they did when Labour, they did in, they did in the last years of Labour as right, well. Yeah. So, I mean, they're generally negative. I mean, about that. They're generally pessimistic. Um, they're, they're always pessimistic about crime rising. It's just how much they think it's rising. Even when it's going down, they think it's going up. So we're pessimistic as a nation. Okay. But uh, Which is reflecting this panel as well. But I think that the, 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 where it will come to is when some finally there will be another Rose Addis type in, incident, somebody on a trolley somewhere who will have a famous child or something like that. And then suddenly it will tip. And that's, but it happens, it's like a big gorilla in the room. It's sort of sitting there quietly, chewing its leaves. But once public <laughs> opinion is awake, then, then whoever's in charge, then the Treasury prints money. Okay. Well, I'm going for an operation on Wednesday, so I may lie. Good luck with that. Right. Uh, for you. Right, let's get some questions. Yeah. There's a gentleman here and there's a lady at the back. Go ahead, sir. Hi, Graham Hunter. A uh, question for Matt. Could you say something about the effect of, on GDP of some of these proposals? And do deficits matter when inflation and interest rates are low? Great question, Graham. And the lady at the back. Hi, um, my name's Yasmin. I work for the Treasury Select Committee and managing an inquiry on decarbonisation. Um, so earlier in the summer, the government legislated for net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Um, and that's going to require a kind of whole economy transformation and will likely create spending pressures across many government departments and maybe not the priority ones that you discussed earlier, like health and pensions. Um, so I was wondering what the panellists think about the extent to which both the public and the major political parties are bought into, bought into the spending needs around this. Great question. And anyone else want to come in? I've got, I have one at the front here, and then we'll get back to the panel. W Willie Plexer Smith. Uh, in the 70s, where, when I was around, one of the ways in which we used to judge the size of the state was by the number of people employed by the state. And that's something that seems to have fallen out of discourse. But I wondered if it could conceivably become an issue in this election after what uh, Jeremy Corbyn said in answer to a question last week when he said that everyone supplying national health services should be directly employed by the national health, which might have come as a bit of a shock to pharmacists and dentists GPs. and GPs. Right, OK, great. We've got a lot to cover there. Matt, Matt do you want to kick us off on... Um, so there's the, there's the impact. This, this modelling is obviously all in static terms in terms of what you do just to increase spending without taking GDP as a given, but... Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, the, the, the focus that we are uh, implying from both of the uh, main parties on investment would suggest that uh, if that is productive investment, then you would hope that that would boost GDP some years out, uh, and that seems to be a clear message that the parties want to, to get out there. Um, and I think situating that within the fiscal position, and again, this sort of goes back to the event we had last week, what that probably means is that the new fiscal rules that the either party wants to put in place are some combination of thinking about not focusing any more on the overall deficit, but thinking only about uh, um, getting to balance or some, some new rule on current spending and allowing themselves to borrow uh, in order to invest. Because, I mean, explicitly they've said it, interest rates are low. We are in a new low interest rate environment, and so of course it makes sense to be borrowing more in order to invest as long as that is the right type of investment. And so I think we'll see a new rule which is current um, budget-based, but also on the debt side where the, the, the capital spending will add up. Then there's a question for the parties as to what's their new approach to debt. And for the last five, ten years, we've been in a position where debt obviously spiked, got up to you know 80% plus of GDP, uh, and everyone was horrified and said, oh, we've got to get it back down really quickly. I think we are now in a world in which there is a realisation that actually with low, in, uh, low in interest rates, that's not necessarily uh, the case, but the parties need to, to say, tell us what they want. What is the sustainable level of debt as they see it? And one of the things we've suggested is that you could turn to looking at debt servicing instead of debt stock. So actually applying those low interest rates to your debt stock. But at the moment, we're not hearing, I mean, obviously it's early days in the campaign, but we're not hearing any of those sorts of conversations just yet from the parties. But I think it is important that we have something in place in order to ground the spending pledges that we're going to get. Pauline, decarbonisation, what do you reckon? Uh, 
I think engaging people in how and what we need to spend money on <coughs> is going to be really, really difficult. Um, we were just talking upstairs about uh, Labour's policy to insulate every home and uh, I think it sounds like they're offering loans to people which of course has been tried before as one of those kind of like obvious policy proposals that everyone says everyone borrow money and you'll save money on your energy bills and everything will be fine you'll end up better off though of course actually lots of people just tend live warmer lives as a result of having lower energy bills rather than actually being able to save money but you know that's there's a uh, there's an e economics law for that. I can't remember what it's called. What about heating? No, about where energy efficiency leads to higher energy yeah. use. Anyone? No. Anyway, there's a there's a there's a rule. Um, I'm in favour of very cold places. So that's <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I think around both there is just this weird thing that we separate spending and investment simply on the basis of whether it is capital or whether it is revenue spending, and I think that that split uh, is sort of weird accountancy uh, to me because there is a real difference between building a hospital to largely give older people better deaths i'm up for that right let's spend money on it but let's not pretend that it has some massive like multiplication factor for economic growth in comparison to building a university or a catapult center or some roads or a train right uh, equally if you spend money on training and education you are investing in the uh, the capability of your people that ought to ideally lead to productivity growth. Um, and that, but that counts as revenue spending because you didn't build a building. And it, I think when we come to climate change, uh, we need to think uh, a bit more creatively about this split as to what counts as investment. I do agree that we should just let investment uh, rise, but it doesn't even all need to be stuff. And actually, some of the stuff that we call investment isn't actually investment. It's just nice stuff that we should be perfectly happy to uh, buy, but we should buy with our taxes rather than buy with borrowing. There is obviously a direct link between your first two questions, which is the, you know, one of the reasons for having different fiscal rules is that if you're looking at the next 15 years, you would hope that dealing with climate change is one of the new focuses of the state, whoever's in charge, given that all parties are now committed to greater or yeah. lesser extent to very ambitious decarbonisation target so you need a rule that has that built in rather than every now and again being saying oh we didn't hit our target because we did some decarbonisation stuff or worse saying we didn't do the decarbonisation stuff. I mean the public have bought climate change emergency and it's shifted from being sort of worried about it to being you know genuinely genuinely recognizing that something's happening the challenge is for for government to actually do it and get get voted in to do dramatic things like massively increase the cost of your holiday or your heating bill uh, etc to change your behavior but i think there's actually in all of this stuff there's more the public are actually more flexible and will go along with things if they believe it's fair and they can see the reasons for it than we might think the public actually accepted austerity they re they actually lowered their expectations of public services cameron and Osborne did a good job of telling people there's no money left. You can argue about whether, whether they should or done or not, but they people fewer people in 2016 said that the state didn't meet their expectations than um, in a, about 10 or 15 years earlier. So one of the things that now unites the planet was a study that we're launching in a, in a month or two is concern about climate change. And because if you live in populous countries like India or China or Indonesia, you have seen in your lifetime absolutely massive shifts. And when we talk about, you know, there's a few fewer birds or something here there it's just like you know whole bits of the country are under concrete it's gone so they get it how we do it i don't know but we do you know this we're in a city that has a congestion charge we did not have a referendum about the congestion charge and yet we've sort of stuck with it somehow the mayor, the mayor we don't get people standing for mayor saying they're going to scrap it i don't think somebody will correct me and that's because we didn't have a, a referendum if it had a referendum it would have been like stockholm or manchester sod it not happening so plastic bag tax 85 percent reduction in plastic bags very minor inconvenience but you know just done uh banning smoking you know, there are things there are public quite like bans in this area so banning things might be part of it and, and i think as as we've seen people's expectations change i'm not sure that the spend on old people is actually going to go in a straight line We're, it's a bit like housing starts you know you saw those charts at the beginning of the century for household formation that go like this and housing starts and you think that by now 
there'll be a sort of masses of people, of pensioners lying on the street, they, you know, nowhere to live. Somehow things flex, and I think that's, that may be part of it. That's because they're all bloody, the pensioners aren't on the streets, yeah. the youth is just yeah, yeah. sharing with each yeah. other, or would they really pissed well, off they're, they're, Yeah, yeah, true. There's Indeed. always a price Indeed. to pay, Ben. There is, like, there is. There is. I've got a 24-year-old, tell me about it. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay. It's, you know, it's your lifestyle choice. Yeah. Uh, um, we all make mistakes in life, there's still time. Uh, now, they're also to save the planet, no more children. Yeah, right. Well, that's yes, it's a big saving. I've only had one, you see, I'm a great climate change warrior. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah. Okay, right. the, um, that's the wall ban. Right. Right. The, um, okay, the... Um, we haven't dealt with Will's question, which is, do people want more people employed by the state? Or is that going to be a political issue? Again, we, have, we didn't actually... But on that, I just say people believe that spending more money on public services generally improves them. They have never bought either government's arguments about choice, competition and reform, despite them being very popular in place in rooms like this. The punters just believe resources make things better. And hence, I mean, and again, whatever we say about Johnson, he does his focus groups... 20,000, you know, lots more policemen, lots more, lots more, lots more. Not reform, just lots more. Um, <laughs> but okay. you used to, used to be able to ask in a poll, you know, do you think all public services should be privatised? Should they all be uh, yeah. nationalised? Or do you just not care so long as it works? Yeah. And, and, you know, that was a sort of Blair mantra, is what matters is what works. And uh, we have come back, I think, to quite an ideological debate about privatisation as if it's inherently a wrong thing, the idea, the profit motive, because apparently taking a profit is, is just intrinsically worse than taking a salary in ways that I can't really understand. Um, but I, 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 and I, don't, I don't know whether that's a, sh a huge shift in public opinion. I don't opinion, think it's shifting Or just that a shift much. in, in I think it's the debate. discourse. I think it's the debate because the public are just, you know, there's about 10% of people who are like my dad who will not have an operation paid for by the state in Booper Hospital because it's not an NHL. He's a sort of trot. There's about 30% we call Essex man who just believe the private sector is better at everything. And everybody else is sort of flexible. Yeah. And it hasn't really shifted. Okay, let's get some questions from the flexible public. Okay, we've got loads now. Let's be quick. Let's have one here, and then Adam, we've got one at the front, and then right at the back. Oh, hi, Naomi Eisenstadt. In the um, figuring out what's going to happen to older people, have you thought about, I mean, I think there's going to be increase in poverty in older people because of, of pen, pensions aren't as good as they were, occupational pensions, gig economy. So there'll be, yeah, there'll be a lot of people who will not have the kind of savings or at least the kinds of pensions that we've come to expect in my generation. So I think that's another gloomy story. That just depends when you're talking about, basically. But go on, go ahead, sir. Uh, Rob Allen, I just wonder what you think the prospects are for the debate on welfare. So I think Ben's slide showed that uh, it's consistently at the bottom of the public's um, priorities, uh, but by the same token, Labour uh, at least tried to talk about it quite a lot. So talk about one of their criticisms of, of austerity is the impact on, on the lowest. Um, at the bottom of the distribution, uh, child poverty, talk a lot about universal credit. Um, what, what do you think the prospects are? Okay, great. And the question right at the back. We've got a mic on the move. Here you go. Thanks. Sam Smethers from Fawcett Society. Um, Matt, aren't your slides just showing a country in decline? Because in 97 we had a government elected on a mantra of education, 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 and actually that is clearly not going to be our future, according to those numbers. Um, but I wanted to come back to the point about what we define as economic activity versus um, investment, because we argue that we should be investing in our social care infrastructure and our childcare infrastructure, because that is an investment. It frees up women in particular to be back in the labour market, and they're making an economic contribution by doing unpaid care work. They're not economically inactive at all. They're making a contribution which frees others up to participate in the labour market. And if we have fewer children, actually we can't afford our ageing population, can we? So there's a massive conflict between what's in the environmental interest and what's in our interest in terms of paying for an ageing population. I'm glad someone's making the case for the kids. There's not, there's not many of them in the room. Uh, right, okay, we've got loads of questions there. So first of all, on, on pension of poverty, so just to be a bit perkier, so we've done, we're, we're in another neck of the woods, done lots of work on pension outcomes today, but also into the future. I don't want to say this with any certainty, because projecting anything 50 years into the future is a mug's game. But just, I'd say we're slightly perkier 
We'll definitely pay them. So there are some small rises happening to, to pension to poverty right now. Those are being driven by cuts to housing benefit. That is, that is the thing. But apart from that, overall pension to poverty levels are obviously very low today. You're half as likely, almost half as likely to be a poor pensioner as you are a poor child today. And that didn't used to be the case traditionally in Britain at all. Poverty in Britain was about old age in the 70s and 60s. So that is a big change. In the future, I think what is definitely right to say and tends to in rooms like this dominate the idea that the future is really bad on pensions is that we, the current cohort retiring of, of public sector workers or, in, or establishment private sector workers with good defined benefit pension schemes and a very expensive house are definitely not going to be exist again in the future. So the top of the distribution is definitely going to have to come down, particularly men. Okay, so white men in the civil service who've got like very large replacement rates, almost their entire income in retirement, that's gone. We won't see that in the future. But for the population as a whole, I think we should be a bit more optimistic, which is we're seeing huge increases in retirement savings right now. Uh, people who never saved, we've got a much better state pension when it comes to women than we used to have. The, um, so the overall numbers don't look as bad. You're going to get a more equal distribution for pensioners. Housing, and then housing basically complicates it. So the, the, the rundown of people retiring without homes, which will have big implications of poverty, paying rent, and the housing benefit bill is all quite a long way off. The cohorts retiring at the moment are all on like 75% um, home ownership rates. It takes quite a long time for some of the younger people in this room to get around to retirement. If any of those people are retiring without home ownership by that point, then yeah, there's big implications. If you're paying rents and you're on a lower income, then the chance of pension poverty is really high. But that's a, that's a worry. For, so I'm a little bit more positive, unless you are a uh, well-paid white man, in which case your retirement's going to be much harder than your dad's retirement was. And that it's called equalisation of the patriarchy. The, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, and relatively a good thing, not for me. The, um, anyway, uh, right, welfare. So we keep banging on about it'd be nice for people to focus on welfare, but the public don't care. So maybe we should well, just give up. Uh, we weirdly have a welfare system which is incredibly stingy when it comes to actually helping people through a period of crisis in their lives. And also so vastly expensive that you know, there's broad public consensus for cutting it. You know, the most popular policy of the coalition for years was putting a cap on the overall uh, benefit claim and uh, of, of £25,000 a year, which has now, now come down even further. Uh, because people hate giving out money for nothing, but they also, they do quite like the idea of uh, being helped themselves when they are ill, unsurprisingly. Um, and, and I just think, we have come so far from the kind of the principles of that beverage system. And there is this danger of course, people then people then say, oh, so we need to have a more contributory based system because then you can build consent for uh, for more generous uh, income replacement levels. Uh, but the problem with that is that we have huge numbers of people who are uh, lifetime sick, who are lifetime disabled or who are you know, facing unemployment because of huge structural barriers having been let down by the education system. And actually, so the numbers of people on uh, just means-tested benefits is is really large. And we don't really have an answer to what you do about people who hadn't then earned an entitlement. Um, and the way in which uh, being stuck on benefits is, uh, I think, an experience which strips people of, of their dignity, in a, in a way puts them at the mercy of some jobs worth down the job centre who probably actually has, you know, only earning 20 grand, not got much experience, not really much use as a work coach uh, as much as they might try or be motivated to help. Uh, and so I, I think it is, we do need to kind of quite structurally rethink our welfare system and we need to do that by engaging the public in, in redesigning it uh, and it is going to have to, to change quite radically. I think one of the huge challenges is housing benefit, which does feed into the pensioner things in that, you know, even Tony Blair used to say, uh, I, it is, he had a speech in 1994 where he said, um, we used to spend 20% of the housing budget on welfare and 80% on infrastructure. And we have failed because now we spend 80% on welfare and 20% on infrastructure. But nobody has fixed that. And we have a housing market which, it, just the price, the cost of housing is far, far too high. And instead of trying to fix that at the market level, we end up propping it up with 
uh, with welfare payments. And I, I think that does have to change. And I think that will help to ease some of the financial burdens in the system, enable us to be more generous around income replacement. So if, if, you, want to, if you want to get people, if you want to point to, to welfare, you've got record anxiety about poverty and inequality. So we've got concern about unemployment has gone down and down and down in our monthly series, but we have record concern about poverty and inequality. It's still only 20% spontaneously, and things need to go over 50 for the for the gorilla to really sort of be moving. But also housing has seen a similar thing. So, And there is there is support, and I, haven't, I don't know where the proposals would be on this or what the Resolution Foundation or Polly would think about it, but there is support for the state borrowing to build again as it last did in the, in the 1970s. Uh, whether we'll hear about that during this election as another promise, we'll see. And that would actually, it sounds as though there might be some broad agreement on some of the benefits of that in terms of outcomes and dealing with the housing benefit bill as well. Definitely. And it is worth remembering, I know the numbers on, if you ask people what do you think about welfare or the word benefits, then you get very low support. If you ask them what do you think about child poverty going up, the homelessness you see on your streets, how we look after disabled yeah. people, how we look after the old, support for all of those things is pretty high. But again, it's not a straightforward uh, topic of conversation. Right, Matt, education, there isn't any. That's yeah. slightly unfair, but basically sounds great. Yeah, so the, the, the country declines, I think it's, it's important to remember um, those figures are not inevitable. They are what happens if you uh, take your hands off the wheel, effectively. And uh, as ever, political choices will make a difference. And so we're in a position where the next government, and I think it is, you know, it starts now, possibly it should have started sooner, but it certainly starts now, has to start thinking about what direction it wants to go in. Uh, and you're absolutely right that yeah, uh, education and many of these things, as, as Polly said, that we think about as being current spending, are investments and are, you know, building up our human uh, capital, as it were. Um, but there's tough choices. There's really tough choices here. And uh, I don't think we're going to hear much about them in the election campaign, but it's really important that the next government starts to to, to get on with it because the, you know what are those choices they are that you don't get quite what you thought you were going to get in retirement or that what your parents got because actually the offer is is different now uh, it's that more of what we do as a state ends up in, in private hands or that you have to seek other ways of topping up what the state does uh, or it's that you have to raise taxes and, and if you do some combination of those things then you can end up in a place where uh, there is education there is a focus on all those other things that, that we value as a society and that help to boost growth going forward uh, and, are, and are good for us. Um, but it doesn't happen if you take your hands off the wheel. And that's, that's all those figures are showing. Great. Let's get one more set of questions in before everyone is released to their day. There's a lady right over here and there's a gentleman in the middle here. Um, Sarah Horner from the Learning and Work Institute. If we're um, sort of in agreement, definitely in this room, that product investment in productivity and skills is actually important for the long-term health of the government uh, and the country, um, how do we start that conversation with the public when very simple messages seem to get through? For example, at the Tory party conference, there were big signs everywhere saying, get Brexit done, more money for NHS police and schools. And it was very simplistic. But that message is obviously getting through because you hear every um, conservative politician saying it at the moment. So is there a way that we can get more complicated messages uh, across to the public? I mean, obviously, we've been seeing quite a large rise in skill spending via student loan subsidies in the last five years. So the, in fact, like 30% increase between 2010 and 2015. So they may not have talked about it, but there's a lot of cash going in for some people. Uh, gentlemen here. Uh, Paul Wallace, I'm a journalist. Um, how electorally plausible is it going to be for Johnson to campaign on, on being the new friend of public services after a decade of austerity sure. and, and given you know, continuing likely pledges about tax cuts? Okay. Anyone else want to come in or we'll wrap up? The, um, okay, Ben, why don't you take that last question? It comes down to, I mean, it come, we're, we're back to this perception of competence. And so Johnson's ratings aren't good for a new prime minister, but in politics, as we know, it's always compared to what? And the, the challenge is literally Corbyn's ratings are absolutely diabolical. So, you know, if he say, you know, so he's sort of sound, he's saying the right things. Do you believe him 
most people won't, but then most people don't believe most things politicians say anyway. But at least he's at least he's addressing the issue. You could say that Matt Hancock is protesting too much. You know, it's endless. I will not privatise the NHS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they're they're doing it for a reason. So are they are they massively convincing? No. Is the public expecting massive improvement? No. But have they are they sort of neutralising the issue? On the polling evidence of the campaign so far, I would have to say that they are. But let's let's see what happens. You know, what is your what is your just to be unfair on you? So yeah. a week in, what is what is well, labour of labour of arising from a floor. You know, they were below. They were at twenty. They started at twenty six percent last time and got to forty one percent. So which is pretty amazing stuff. This time they started at around twenty four percent. They're now at about twenty seven. So you know, you can draw a line if you like to victory if you're a die hard Labour supporter. But I mean, Labour of you know, Labour have never ever polled below you know 28 29 percent in living memory so they were always going to go up i thought they were going to break that rule last time and I'm, i'll never say that again because they started at 26 and i thought they'd only go down and shows what an idiot i am so i but i but it looks as though i mean you know the conservatives have neutralized are potentially neutralizing this and the long list of promises from labor because of this challenge over perceived competence, just become, you know, it's just sort of noise. I mean, all of this detail, we're all really weird people in here because you come to events like this. Most people are not paying a lot of attention, which you could say cynically or otherwise. The Conservatives know that. They're the people doing all the market research, far more than the Labour Party, about trying to target those messages. In the Remember, most constituencies won't change hands. This is all about 10 to, 10 to 15% of constituencies that will be actually serious in play and it's about those voters in those places and it's that's what it boils down to in modern politics great thank you for that uplift uh, Polly <laughs> the um, uh, why don't you all talk about skills Tony you know, I used to do this a really annoying thing where he'd say um, I could get a, I, th I think it, I'm being maybe unfair here so this, but let's assert that he said this because I can't none of you are going to prove it I think yeah. he said I could invade Iraq I could announce another invasion of Iraq so long as I did it in another speech about technical education <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think this is a version of his is that true uh, no, I mean, I think people love apprenticeships. You will endlessly no. get p a policy pledges about apprenticeships. And, and honestly, if you can find me a, a business education or skills minister in the last 20 years who hasn't stood up and given a speech about parity of esteem between <laughs> vocational academic qualifications, then honestly, I don't know. I, 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 going well, though, yeah, right? Yeah, how's that going for them? It doesn't make any difference. They just stand up and say it as if, like, they, the very important minister, having parity of esteem and saying that these two things are equally important is job done. Um, and uh, and it's, not, it's also a weird kind of dichotomy. Like, my sister is a vet, which last time I checked is a vocational qualification, which comes with some esteem. Um, and, uh, uh, but never mind. Um, it, it, it is a bad, it's one of those, I think, you can you can get a lot of money. You can you know George Osborne even put up taxes to pay for apprenticeships, mm. and that is a measure of how yeah. popular you can make them. It, and it is very simple, and it sounds you know oh we'll have a German style economy and everything will be all great. And people say that sort of stuff. Um, I think it is it is one of those really really difficult policy areas, uh, which has repeatedly had the same problem is that when the state invests lots of money in uh, in skills education or, and, and through companies, they end up cannibalizing what the companies were already spending. And then the treasury start to worry about it, saying that it's just, there's no value added here. We're just, it's just dead weight. And so they cancel it, at which point the companies do spend. It just feels like we can't get above this ceiling and it's either the state or the company spending it. But getting actually up I, is one of those policy puzzles that I... I, I don't know, I'd be open to a solution to if anyone's got one. Okay, great. Um, right, well, look, can we uh, thank our panel for their contributions today? Thank you. Can I, um, can I in particular um, thank Matt for writing the report, but also this is Matt's last week at the Resolution Foundation after over 11 long years here, which is quite a few uh, elections. That's like we've worked out you've done... This is the start of the fourth. 65, 66 um, reports, nearly 100 uh, blogs for the Resolution Foundation, so thank you for each of those. Uh, but thank you more for being a great friend and a great colleague. 
over those uh, years. So everyone at RF wants to, we're not going to give them gifts here, don't worry, before you start again. <laughs> That's all been done, okay? But, like, uh, but we do want to thank you for everything you've done and wish you all the good luck in the world for the new job. So enjoy your new job and all of you enjoy your democratic process over the next six weeks. It may feel as long as those 11 years, who knows? <laughs> have fun, have a good day, everyone. <laughs>